All right, listen, let's let's set a bit of a foundation uh, before we bring our guests in. Uh, in 2017, it was determined by a nation that Galamse was priority one. We were at risk of losing our natural resources and also our environment. Uh, the water bodies were at risk and uh, our forests were under threat. The president himself took the lead in this fight, put his presidency on the line, and declared um, several actions to combat it. These actions failed. I think we can state that as fact now. Because our water turbidity is worse. We have lost more of our forests. And Galamse continues unabated. But there are real costs to this failure. And today we want to look at that. In particular, looking at the environmental and the risk to us, which is also a huge cost. Now, we'll start from the environmental angle. Erastus Asaridonko, of course, has brought us so many of these stories. Uh, Erastus, as we speak, your eye has not come off Galamsi. Tell us, are things better, worse, or the same? Things are worse. And worse physically you can see it take a trip from I am free the I am free main I am free road Wasada Diaso area and look on the sides of the road you could see um, uh, uh, you know tailings sludge from mining Swing, you know flowing like a stream along the roadside you could see deep excavations within townships. It's by the roadside, the main I am free, Diasu Road. So it, you can't miss it. People mining with impunity almost everywhere. Now go to the Ofin River. The river now is like a, a muddy pool <laughs> with lots of champans, over 300 of them. Previously, when we went there, we counted about 200, 150, 200. Now, Every, almost every part, Achuman Punwa, Achuman Wabieja portions of the Ofen River, inundated with champagne machines. As we speak, when you look at the Ofen, it will shock you. It's a lifeless, flowing liquid. Now go on the Ancobra. We just came back from the Ancobra about a month ago. And this was after the Deputy Lands Minister put up a, a claim, in fact a false claim, that the, at the estuary, the river was getting better. And in fact, we saw that that was just a phenomenon that lasted for two hours. The Ancobra, as polluted as it is, is not polluting the sea. And we, we, we sat on a boat and we rowed for four hours on the Ancobra from the estuary, Azim. We passed through uh, areas like uh, Dominase, Banso, Angulanzo, Duale. And these are communities on the Ancobra. And if you look at the number of Samfan machines sitting directly on the Ancobra, mining within the Ancobra, it will shock you. Hmm. And a colleague of mine, J.D. Pels, did testing of the Ancobra last year. The CSIR did that test. And if you look at the data, the levels of uh, mercury, lead, arsenic in the Ancobra, the acceptable levels for WHO acceptable standards, we are talking about 0 0.001. We are seeing 0 0.016, 0 0.017, 18. <sighs> lead mercury arsenic in the ancobra if this is not shocking anybody then let's continue to pollute it every river we have crossed the pra the brim the beer the tunnel every river in this country is highly polluted <laughs> and you can now the trend previously when we did the i did the first documentary the uh, destruction for gold we were not seeing champagne machines on major rivers. 
Now we are seeing lots of them on major rivers and cobra, uh, uh, often the beer. When you go to Pristia, Bogoso, all the tributaries filled with chamfan machines. Hmm. Erastus, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll get we'll get a bit more from you in a while, but um, I want to bring in Suleiman Abraham at this point. Um, uh, this this report from Professor Frimpong Boateng, which is making so many waves. When you look at the reactions and responses to it by people in government, so far the messaging has been that this report is to be dismissed. But on the ground. The damage continues. How have we traveled from 2017, six years of claiming to fight Galamsey, only for it to be worse? And in a report that is highlighting the reasons why we are failing, we're told that, well, ignore it by the people who are supposed to lead us to win. At this point, is it unreasonable for Ghanaians to throw their hands up and say Galamse will never be stopped? Well, Kojo, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. First of all, I I think it is right to say that uh, we've always had the phenomenon of Galamse with us predating the current Ekufuado regime. I believe that under President Mahama, there was Galamse, under Atamel, there was Galamse, under Kufo, even under Rollins. I believe that people were engaged in activities that would, would be qualified to be called Galamse. I think what we are talking about now is um, a phenomenon of uh, a free for all illegal mining activities under the Ekufuadu regime. Because as I said, Galamse has always been there, but never in the history, <laughs> in, you know, in my adult life have I witnessed Galamse at the scale that it is being done now. And ironically, w this is happening at a time when a president says, I am putting my presidency on the line to fight this phenomenon. So the question is, why is it that under the Kufuado regime, Galamse has literally become something that is almost becoming a normal thing. Uh, it is being fought in West, just as promises are made in West. And in reality, we are not seeing any results in terms of a real fight against Galamse. Now, uh, the interministerial committee was, you know, uh, formed ostensibly to deal with the phenomenon, to help government deal with the phenomenon. At that time, we heard about the seizure of excavators, burning of excavators, and so on and so forth. And I believe all those things were just a camouflage to just create the impression that something was happening. But in reality, as Erastus has always made us aware, in reality, not much is being done. I believe that President Ekufuado, when he said he was willing to put his presidency on the line, was basically saying it for the applause and not, you know, meaning it in, 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 in deed. Because, look, yes, I agree, it is not easy dealing with the Galante phenomenon. It's a complex uh, phenomenon. Um, people, people are struggling to survive. And so if there is gold... Uh, in the soil on which they live, however, it, whatever it takes to be able to extract um, the minerals, they may be tempted to do that. So it's not an easy thing. It is political. Uh, while it was happening, President Mahama was also out there saying, look, all those who have been arrested and detained when I win, I will, I will grant them you know, uh, amnesty or something like that. So it's a very complex phenomenon, no doubt about that. But the consequences of it, he said that any leader who means well for this country, not just at the moment, but the future of this country, would ensure that whatever it takes to deal with the phenomenon, you know, uh, those actions will be taken. So for me, 
I, I don't have any doubt that, look, why? National Security will be briefing the president, I mean, every day about these issues because it also constitutes a security threat for our country. There is no doubt about that. But hmm. to the extent that this government has looked on and we've gotten to where we are, and now thanks to Professor from Paul Blackman's report, we are getting to know that some people, even at the presidency, are implicated in this whole phenomenon. I think that the, the real conclusion one can draw is that, look, the president didn't and doesn't care about Galamse and all the consequences that we are talking about. Because I believe if he cared, and he cares, we wouldn't be where we are at the moment. Now, I, I want us to focus on the responses that have come in to this report, uh, particularly the response from the presidency that I found to be particularly noteworthy. Uh, and I, I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs uh, from it. So this is what um, this is what they said in response. Uh, the attention of the office of the president has been drawn to a publication in the media um, by the former minister for environment and so forth, um, which allegedly imputes wrongdoing on the part of some government appointees in the fight against Galamse. At the outset, it must be pointed out that the document being discussed was not an official report formally delivered to the office of the president. On the contrary, it can only be rightly referred to as a catalogue of personal grievances and claims made by professor frimpon Boating intended to respond to some issues he faced as chairperson of the imcim the document was handed to the chief of staff at the office of the president on march 19 2021 in an informal meeting where professor frimpon Boating complained about public attacks and criticisms made about his tenure as chairperson of the imcim this was after Professor Frimpon Boating's tenure as minister had not been renewed by the President of the Republic in his second term. The document did not have a transmittal or cover letter, nor indeed an addressee, such as to suggest that it was submitted to the Chief of Staff for action. It is noteworthy that the IMCIM was a creature of cabinet, and any formal report on its activities would normally be submitted to cabinet through the cabinet secretary or directly to the president of the republic as chairperson of cabinet till date professor frimpon Boating has done neither it is important also to point out that whilst professor frimpon Boating makes serious allegations against some government appointees as having been involved in supporting or interfering with the fight against illegal mining not a single piece of evidence was adduced or presented to enable the claims to be properly investigated indeed the allegations contained in the document are at best hearsay it is instructive that since professor frimpon Boating's meeting with the chief of staff in march 2021 he has taken no step nor acted in furtherance of the matters contained in the document the president's commitment to fighting illegal mining is unassailable and the office of the president welcomes any information on illegal mining activities which provides a credible basis for investigations to be conducted by the cid of the ghana police service we continue to count on the cooperation of the general public uh, uh, yeah I i'd love your thoughts on this before i bring in our other guest kobe mensa uh, from the university of ghana well I, I i i would say that this is really a disaster of a response uh, from the presidency. You see, we are talking about a very, very serious national problem. And the, pres the, the office of the president would want to trivialize it by, you know, pandering to issues of uh, how letters should be written, uh, transmittal, whatever, reference numbers, and so on and so forth. It's almost like somebody going to the police to uh, report to the police that, look, there's this crime going on, and I think it has to be investigated. And then we all witness the crime indeed happening, and the, the police then tells us that, look, the person who came to make the complaint didn't write a formal report, didn't uh, 
you know, go through the appropriate channels to, to file their complaint, uh, did not actually to go through whatever it is to send a complaint to the IGP and so on and so forth. The question is, and so what? The most important thing is that, is, is, uh, is Galamse happening? Is our environment being destroyed? Are our water bodies being destroyed? And the answer to all these is yes. And the president, is the, is the presidency saying that Professor Frimpong Watten is the one who is supposed to then go ahead and investigate the matter? And really, are we having leadership or we are not? Because for me, I would have expected the presidency to issue a, a, a response or a statement that says, look, we acknowledge what is going on. We acknowledge this report. We, we are taking a very serious look at it. The, the, the president, as indicated, is committed to the fight against Galamse. And given this report, immediate steps have been taken to commence investigations into this matter. And indeed, if any officers at the presidency you happen to be <coughs> implicated as claimed in the report, the president would not hesitate in making sure that the right decisions are made and persons who have to be prosecuted are prosecuted. This would be a statement that demonstrates seriousness on the part of the government. Mm. But you see, I am not surprised. Because yes, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. I don't think that there is any commitment, real and tangible commitment towards the fight against, uh, the no. fight against illegal mining, Galam say. Because if indeed there is, and then as they claim, the president's commitment is unassailable. If there is a commitment and a crime is happening, the crime is getting worse by the day. We are seeing it happening. The impact and implications are there. The, the eventual consequences on us are manifest. And then you continue to say that, oh, we are fighting it, we are fighting it, we are fighting it. Would we tolerate anything like that if this was coming from any other person? I believe the obvious response is no. So the presidency should stop, you know, uh, behaving as if the people of Ghana don't have senses. Sometimes some of these things make us feel, ah, are they thinking that because they are in leadership, all of us can no longer think? Because we see that things happening. They don't say, has it stopped? It is no. And then somebody who was in charge, the chairman of the interministerial committee set up by the same government, set up by the same president, is telling you, these are the things that I know as chairman of the interministerial committee and a minister, a cabinet minister in charge of, you know, science and technology, innovation, blah, blah, blah. And these are the things that I know. Then you say, look, it's hearsay. We don't care about it. Are we serious at all? I don't think we are. And like I said, I am not surprised because I really don't think that the government is committed to the fight against Galam State. And the, the consequence is what we are seeing. It's all over. Now, Suleiman, you when you say... Legal you say, mining, I mean, yeah. mining, if it is legalized, why not? Because we have the resource and the people of the country, the country itself must benefit from it. We are talking about mining that is destructive to the environment, mining that is obviously illegal. And if we are not careful, we will get to a point that everybody will start digging, so long as they know how to do it. And then we, we, would, we would then all be in trouble. We we'll have Burkina Bays, Nigerians, Malians, everybody will be in. And all they do is to start digging, not just Chinese, as we've always complained. So the earlier the president really become, I mean, gets committed to the fight, I think the better for all of us. Now, when you say, you know, the presidency's response, uh, it's, it's as if, you know, we, we don't know what is happening. We don't know what we're about. They're taking us for granted. Is that not the reality? Because we all know that the destructions are going on and seemed unconcerned about the destruction of our environment. Is that not what has become the case now? No, absolutely. That is what it is. And that is why I, I make the conclusion that I mean, I don't think that the president really cares about it because if he, he does, um, we, we would not be in the situation that we are in. And it's a very, very sad development mm. to, um, to see our water bodies in the state that they are now and appointees of the president, as, as Professor from Paul Boatin, um indicated in the uh, report, appointees of the president, mm. people calling him as, he said, as if he runs... Uh, the mining information service in this country. People related to government, people related to the president, 
calling him, um, intervening in different ways. And this man writes a report instead of the government and you know the, the presidency saying, look, whatever it is, mining, illegal mining is a serious matter. And anything about it, we would take it seriously. Given that this is coming from somebody who was the head of the interministerial committee, somebody who was a cabinet minister, we take these claims very, very seriously, and we would immediately commence investigations into it. I, I think that this is something that even warrants the setting up of a presidential commission of inquiry, where the people who are named are called, you know, to respond to the claims that have been made. And if indeed it turns out that, oh, Professor Favor Barton was just lying on his bed and decided to just craft something, why not? Then we know that, oh, this man was not telling us the truth. But we would all get to see. And that would be a demonstration of the president's commitment. And, I mean, how serious he's taking the fight. But to just brush this thing aside as if, you know, it is coming from some, uh, some, some, someone on the street who is known to be insane, I think it's really unfortunate but again, it's an affirmation of the fact that the government doesn't care, and I don't know why, whether it is because some appointees might be involved in the process, or as we heard some time ago, party here, you no know, 2024 is coming. So party here, Sika, and therefore, if people will get into it and be able to finance the party and its campaign in 2024, so be it. I think it's, it's a very sad development, but... Well, as we say, the, the natural resources of this country are entrusted in the hands of the president on behalf of all of us. But um, as they will say in Chi, as a Bushapeni, a year back, So, what can we say? All right. Um, we're joined by uh, Dr. Kobe Mensah. He's an associate professor, uh, Professor Kobe Mensah, associate professor at the University of Ghana Business School. Prof, it's, a good, uh, it, it's good to have you. Good morning to you. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, now, uh, you, you joined us while we were talking about responses, particularly the response from the presidency. One thing is clear. The entire statement is communicating the reasons why the presidency the presidency did nothing and will do nothing about Professor Frimpong Boating's report. So uh, it's a catalog you. of reasons why they will do nothing. Politically, what does this communicate if the presidency, the office of the man leading the fight, is explaining that he will do nothing about allegations made by one of his own former ministers? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that you were not wrong to say that uh, to call uh, my title as Dr. Kovimensa because it's right. Uh, obviously, right. once you're associate professor, you mm -hmm. can still use your title as uh, doctor. So you were not wrong in saying that. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, secondly, uh, let me say that you know there are two reasons why uh, the presidency should have taken this communique seriously, regardless of how they look at it. If you check the website of the presidency, uh, they put on a statement, a press release, and you know put uh, from Pom Boatin's report and the report in inverted commas, uh, which means that they do not regard it as a report, and they ostensibly say that in the press release to say that it couldn't be counted as a report uh, because. He didn't actually write it as an official request from the presidency. Now, regardless of whether it was an official request from the presidency for him to write that or not, I think that two things are very clear why the presidency should have taken it seriously and perhaps addressed the nation on that. Because one, we pay or we put a lot of incentives uh, for people to be whistleblowers and we we'll actually campaign that a number of times asking people to come forward with information uh, on certain activities, especially things that actually bother on good governance, etc. Uh, so that authorities based on that could further investigate. So that in itself, even if the report was not officially commissioned, uh, it, it actually fits within that principle, that perimeter that the state is always welcoming a certain kind of information that could lead to substantial investigation. So 
even if it wasn't requested, on that basis, perhaps they should have actually taken that seriously. Secondly, uh, the president has highlighted his utmost, you know, interest in fighting Galamse to the point that he said he will put his presidency on the line. Uh, he actually organized, you know, quite a lot of resources, uh, putting together Galam Stop and so many other, you know, uh, words that or naming or branding that they could find as an attempt to fight this particular menace. So on these scores, you would actually think that if someone had detailed such so-called report, which you know, the president doesn't actually recognize that, even if it wasn't officially you know, uh, put together, you would, you would think that the president would act on it. Uh, even not, if not in public, perhaps they could have actually taken other steps that they could actually inform the country that indeed when such a report was put forward, uh, certain in the bold steps, certain credible steps were taken. We haven't actually heard that. And that makes it very worrying because then it means that none of the things that the president say could be taken seriously because they themselves are not taking seriously the measures that they have actually put in place to get this country on the right path. So that is very, very worrying. Hmm. Now, we've heard several people in government attribute the NPP's performance in the last election or the, the, the drop in performance compared to their 2016 victory to um, the, the loss of support in areas where Galamse was happening. You, we've heard them attribute their drop in performance to that. Uh, what does that communication tell you uh, in terms of what they intend to do for 2024 where they want to break the eight? Hmm. Now, I don't think that it is uh, very logical to say that because of your fight against Kalamse, uh, that is why you actually lost the vote. I mean, uh, with all due respect, if we have to put together the areas that are, you know, or the people that are involved in Kalamse, and then look at that in the percentage, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the number of votes, you know, prior. I don't think that anyone could actually make that substantial, you know, argument that it's because of a fight against something that is not deemed as legitimate and so it's costing you votes. I think that it is a general, you know, performance, you know, of the administration, the idea that, the administration had not delivered, especially against its own promises, and that is why you know uh, people uh, generally you know uh, sort of voted against the administration. So I think that it could only be kind of a propaganda to say that because of your fight against Galamse, people voted against you, and as a result, you are not going to take that seriously. What about the significant number of people who are actually against? You know, Galamse, who are in the majority, and as a result of your effort to curb that, would vote for you. What about that? So I think that it isn't, you know, uh, what you call a legitimate, you know, claim. In in political communication, we would say that it's a cut stacking because you're only painting a picture that is not a whole. So I think that it would only be considered as propaganda kind of, you know, uh, uh, legitimation. But it cannot be a very legitimate you know, call for why they're not taking action. I don't think so. Okay. Now, um, let me get to you, Erastos. So, uh, I mean, one of the areas that uh, Professor Frimpon-Boatin talks about is an area that you are familiar with, the Paprama Forest and Cobro Forest. Um, and he talks about the destruction in there. In one of those forests, we had uh, military men protecting these illegal miners. You have been going back there. What's the situation? Well, uh, the situation has not changed. In fact, large parts of the Apamprama Forest Reserve have been destroyed. It's now filled with pits, gullies, and uh, uncleaned, uh, you know, devastation over there. You know, the most affected is the Odaho uh, section and the Kobro section. In fact, in 2018, when we went there. Operation Vanguard had already gone there and tried to stop 
this miner in the forest. In fact, they seized the equipment, took them, tried to take them away. On their way, the same calls that Professor from Pomboate is talking about came to them. They returned the equipment and apologized to the illegal miner. When we went in there, the idea, and it was under the leadership of uh, one Chuman Pofu, Ajikum, who was, in fact, uh, serious about stopping the illegality in the forest. We were shown documents indicating that Imperial Heritage Mining had a prospecting license. And so what they were doing in the forest was supposed to be prospecting. But you don't do prospecting mining with over 25 excavators. And that was what was happening in there. In fact, when we went in there, lots of calls came, not to my phone, but to the phone of uh, Chuman Pofuajikum, who led the team there. And then the commander, we, uh, I've forgotten the full name, but we used to call him across. He's a military commander who was heading the uh, operation. The calls that came to his phone, he handed the phone over to somebody and said, he, he doesn't pay calls when he's on duty. And so he wants to finish what he came there to do. And that's how come we managed to, uh, they managed to get 25 excavators in the forest. Some of them, they, were, they had hidden them in the uh, bushes. And we had to use the whole day. We left the place around 12 midnight, mm. cutting these excavators to Accra. In fact, I remember the threats that came to uh, Mr. Ampovajikum, that if he doesn't return the excavators, they will make sure he doesn't come back to the team. And true to that word, after that operation, he never, he was never allowed to go back to the interministerial committee. And that's when they brought in a Kowawisi, and we all know what happened. So, yes, the calls come from different angles, from military officers, from uh, people who claim to be at the Flagstaff House, people at the seat of government, people I know are very uh, uh, close to the president and all that. I will not mention names. And I have said it during my reports in 2018, from 2018 coming 2021. If you check my reports on YouTube, they are there. I've said it. That very powerful people are the ones who call for Chinese people who are arrested in mining areas to be released. For the Interministerial Committee, the Operation Vanguard, and other people who have gone to sites to do their jobs to leave the place. They will either tell you we own these concessions or the people who are mining there are our people. So please leave the site. Mm -hmm. When we went to Tabosri in the Upper Wasa uh, forest area, I remember in 20, I think 2020, the, the area, the vast forest land had been divided and given to Chinese people to mine. So that? the person who says he owns that land goes over every month to take his cut. Hmm. And at that time, the figure that we were giving on the ground was 50000 a month. Hmm. So he himself is not mining. He claims to own the concession and has given it out. Some of them, they said it was given to them by Minerals Commission themselves. As to documents, they were not able to provide any documents. And all these are captured in my video reports, which are on YouTube since 2018. So what uh, Professor from Pombat is saying, the only difference is that in my report, I did not mention names, but he is mentioning names. Mm. Mm. Let's, I mean, let's hear from Suleiman Abraima on, you know, military persons or I mean, some in, in, from the security agencies protecting these illegal miners. Suleiman, you, you, you expect these persons to, you know, ensure the right thing is done. But here they are. And yesterday when we had, um, you know, the legal advisor to Operation Vanguard join us, he actually said, that's the situation. You go there, they tell you this is a land reclamation site, only to find them engaged in illegal mining. And in his case, he saw military men protecting these illegal miners. How? Well, <clears throat> that is the, the tragedy of our situation. Um, everything is rotten from the tail to the head. Um, and then, of course, um, you do expect that 
at least there will be some leadership by example that would uh, sort of try to gradually change the situation. But unfortunately, that is not what we find ourselves in now. Um, Galamsea has gotten to the point where I believe almost every individual may have a friend or long-distant uh, relative or somebody that is known to them who may be familiar with the processes. And they will tell you, oh, um, yeah, the police, they will come, but what you need to do is to find something for them and then they will go, or uh, they will tell you when they will be coming so that on that day you don't go to site. The people will tell you, oh, as for the chief and the district chief executives, they are the ones who would even tell us when not to go and when to go. And, of mm -hmm. course, when something comes up, we dash them something. So the, 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 the unfortunate situation is that, look, it's, it's almost like <clears throat> everyone is doing it. Even people at the top are using it to make money. So if you are here at the local level and then you say that you, don't, you are not interested, then um, what are you doing to yourself? Uh, 0241 said, look, this illegal mining, my chief, you are aware of it. If you are a chief and people want to mine in your area and you object to it, there is no way it will happen. You would claim that, well, you'll be overpowered, the people are powerful, and so on and so forth. And as he asked them, has anyone come to me to say, look, this thing is happening in my area and I have, this, I have attempted to stop it and it's not working? So the unfortunate thing is um, everyone is um, it's a culprit, it's, it's, it's culpable. But that is why we have a leader. You know, the police, we would say that, oh, the police administration, you don't have, you have, you know, bad elements in the police and so on and so forth. But that is why there is a leader who is supposed to ensure that certain policies and measures are implemented so that those who are bad elements can gradually be identified and rooted out. I believe that if we have a leader, a president today, who is really solidly committed to the fight against Galamse. It may take some time, but absolutely not over a year for us to begin to see real and tangible evidence of results of that commitment. But if you have a president who said in 2017 that he's willing and ready to put his um, presidency on the line in the fight against Galamse, and the phenomenon is escalating and, you know, doubling and multiplying, then you ask yourself, what, what exactly has the president been doing? And what, was, what, what did that commitment really mean? Is it the case that as a country, as a nation, the president with all the powers, commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, the one to whom all others report, has indeed no, you know, lost that fight to the extent that Ankobra, Pra, or Fing, almost all these rivers are now polluted. And the question is, have we imported any fresh Ghanaians from anywhere or it is still the same Ghanaians who have been in this country when these rivers were, were clean? So why is it that over the last six or so years we are seeing an escalation of this and it is being done with impunity? I think that, as I said, if we have a leader who is truly committed to helping deal with this problem, we would see results, even if it is not completely eliminated. We would see a drastic reduction of it. Um, uh, Prof Mensah, the, the president in 2017, his very first year of being president, took this up as priority one. He said he was going to put his presidency on the line to fight this canker. Today, Galamse is worse than it was when he made the promise. He has, in fact, failed. Do, are those who are calling for his resignation calling for too much, or should the president be genuinely considering stepping down? Well, I, I, I'm, I don't know, but I, I don't think that if people are calling for his resignation, they're wrong or they're far from... Uh, right, uh, because elsewhere we've seen when you know leaders have actually swept under the carpet, you know uh, things that they hold, you know, in a very high esteem, especially things that actually underscores 
their leadership, which uh, obviously the president having said that he will put his presidency on the line, actually suggests that the fight against Galamse corruption and all those things actually underscore his leadership and was supposed to be uh, one of the cardinal legacies you know, when he's gone. And unfortunately, it's escalating. Now, obviously, when it happens like that, uh, elsewhere people will call for your resignation, and rightly so, because the kind of things that define your leadership, which the president you know, in the past had actually demonstrated, or not demonstrated, but had actually sounded, that these are things that actually, you know, define his leadership. Then, of course, they would call for your resignation. Uh, I think that the president himself must reflect on what these things does to his own credibility and his own authority. Uh, they hugely undermine his credibility and authority to the extent that you had, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Gabio Chodako say on radio, that you report me to the president for the president to do what? I mean, if you have to say that to, in an ordinary conversation, if someone is actually reporting you to your parents, and you have to say that, now, in our language, and I'm sure in our culture, it means a lot of things, including that your dad would never do anything or has no authority <coughs> in doing anything. And so I think that at some point, the president must reflect in exactly what this does to his authority and his credibility. In fact, to the entire presidency, it is getting to a point where people would not ordinarily entertain any fear for doing the wrong things in this country, generally. You remember the president actually reported Yan Techi's case to the police. Uh, have you had any response on that? Has there been any investigation? We've never had any investigation, at least an investigation and a report to even say that, well, the president has been acquitted because the ABCD or the case has been, you know, thrown away because it lacks any merit. We've never had anything. There's no, I don't think that I've heard anything, you know, to that effect. And I don't think that you guys have any record of something to that effect. Gradually, the president is losing authority because of his continuous disregard for some of these things. And I'm afraid it's actually, you know, sort of uh, going a, a long way to affect the office of the president, not only his regime, but invariably it becomes the notion that, in fact, in this country, nothing is taken at serious, even to the point of an entire generational, uh, what we call resources, like, you know, our river bodies could be taken serious. And I think that it is a very serious issue, you know. Uh, something that others would have addressed the nation if they had received so-called reports, as they claim it, you know, would have addressed the nation on it and had actually outlined the measures that they were going to take. And, and I'm very sure that if President Akufuado was in a position, hadn't actually taken in the power by then, he would have actually spoken to Ghanaians about how serious this is. Mm. Fortunately or unfortunately, he's a president, and he decides what he wants to do. But he should reflect, I think he should reflect, what these things do to his legacy and to his authority and to his credibility. Very, very bad. Very, mm. very bad. And so those who are calling for his resignation, I don't think they're wrong. Uh, of course, I wouldn't say that he should resign because I'm not the one to tell him. But, of course, when people feel so strongly about it and they are complaining, this is really serious. And elsewhere, the presidency or the, the, uh, or the president would consider taking action, whether resignation is the right one or to put in serious measures to make sure that he can nail it and demonstrate to people that, indeed, he meant what he said. He would have taken that course, but, of course, if you look at the press release, it tells you that they absolutely have no interest in, in whatsoever we think about. Um, uh, Sulemana, let me bring you back in here as we're talking about the president and what should happen next. Um, in this report, which let's not forget, 
was written by a former minister who was the chair of an interministerial committee set up by the president to look into Galamsey. His report states on at least three occasions the president was informed of something that was being done that required his intervention. The president said he would look into it and as far as we can tell, nothing happened. Should the president at this point not be addressing this report personally? Should there not be some statement or comment from the president himself about how he has been characterized in the report? Well, I think, I think indirectly we've heard from the president because if a statement is issued from the presidency, uh, I believe that is supposed to be the position of, of the president. And so um, I, I don't know how else um, the president would, would personally uh, make his views heard. And I don't, I don't expect that if he is to do that, it would be something contrary to what his office has already, um, has already put out. But again, that convinces me the more that perhaps um, the president basically either didn't care about the phenomenon or um, didn't really want to fight it um, for one reason or the other. And it is not surprising to find that a number of his appointees and persons close to his office or himself um, are implicated in the Prempon Boateng report. And I, I, I think it will be it will be um, naive for anyone to want to completely trash or rubbish the report by Professor Van Pompwatin. Look, this is not um, someone that we don't know. This is an accomplished um, professional, even though, well, in politics, it was the first time he was holding a ministerial position. But this is not someone that you would say, oh, well, without this uh, office as a minister, he wouldn't be able to sort out himself and so on. For God's sake, there's a cardiac, I mean, a, 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 a cardiac surgeon, you know, um, who has accomplished, you know, in his, who is accomplished in his career. And I believe that Professor from Fonbouaten, anywhere in the world that he would want to practice, he can. So it is not somebody that would say, oh, he's doing this because he's gone hungry, or he just wants to fight back or blackmail people because he couldn't get appointment. But that is what, somehow, the presidency would want us um, to believe. So, I mean, for me, it all boils down to the fact that we have a government that is really not committed to the fight against Galamse because perhaps Galamse is bringing in a lot of money to party boys, to party people, to party officials, party executives, who then would be able to use that to support, you know, the party in one way or the other. But otherwise, if we have a government that is truly committed to the fight against Galamse, we wouldn't be where we are. And that is why, as I said, we've had previous governments. It isn't as if there was no Galamse. There was Galamse. But we didn't see it at the scale that we've seen it under President Ekufuado. Is it because why? Suddenly under Ekufuado, the population has increased and the number of Galamseyers have also increased? No. It is because under him, the, the, the leeway to engage in Galamse perhaps has become quite open. And it's become... You know, the, the, the incentives for engaging in Galamse perhaps is even more. Because at the end of the day, it will just be um, talk that, oh, actions will be taken, actions will be taken, and nothing will be done. Mm. And somehow, that's quite insulting to the people of Ghana. Making them feel, oh, for Ghanaians, if you say we'll do it, we'll deal with it, they will believe it. And then you just do whatever you want. Well, the president has about two years to go. Um, in fact, a little less than two years to go. Uh, it's not late yet. He is still our leader. He is our president. And and the earlier he really um, decides to take action on this matter, the better for all of us. Otherwise, he will leave a legacy that will be terrible. Mm. Uh, as far as this sector is concerned, not to talk about the other sectors, but as far as the mining sector is concerned. And I believe that advisors to the president and he himself must begin to think about how people will talk about him. What people would say about him when he leaves office. Today he has power. Not too many people are able to speak. And of course, we all know that <laughs> um, under the same administration, it's increasingly difficult for people to express themselves. 
without any replication. Mm. Um, the few of us who are engaging in it, well, people would say, oh, be careful, because you know the system and all of that. But I think the president should be keen to think about what people would say about him, what people would say about his leadership, what people would say about his legacy when he leaves office. Because for me, it is important that you leave office and hear positive things about yourself. You leave office and people praise you. You leave office and people want to get closer to you. Rather than exercising the power you have now in a way that after you leave power, you would regret. Because at that time, anybody can say anything that they want to you and you have no power to act against them. And I believe that is what the advisors and family members and the president himself must begin to think about. In a year and uh, maybe nine months or so from now, he will be a former president. What mm. would people be saying about him? Would he be happy to hear the kinds of comments that people would say about him? For me, that is what is critical. It's not about how much he would have when he leaves power. It's not about how much he would have empowered his family members and friends when he leaves power. At the end of the day, it will be about what people will be saying about him and his leadership and his legacy for right. our country. Right. I want to wrap with Erastus. We've got just about 30 seconds, but this is the last thing I'd like to hear your thoughts on, Erastus. Look, uh, the, the, w time is running out for our, for our water bodies, for our forests, for our land. Uh, but we have reported these things until we are blue in the face. From the perspective of the media, what more can be done? I, I think um, uh, we are all shooting differently, but if we uh, group our shots and if all media uh, stations will come on board and will form a strong alliance, because this is about our existence as a people, we should all group and form an alliance and forge ahead strongly. I am even thinking of forming a strong media coalition where, like a tax force, will go around and see things for ourselves and take hold of the situation and report it as it is mm. to be able to effect positive advocacy uh, for this. We should see it as uh, an attack on our very existence and we should go at it from all angles in a unified form to achieve results. Mm. Erastus, uh, you just might have uh, hit on something there. This is a conversation that can't end here. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for uh, the time of our other guest. Suleiman Abraima uh, is Executive Director of Media Foundation for West Africa. Kobi Mensah, Dr. Kobi Mensah is Associate Professor at the University of Ghana Business School. Erastus, uh, of course, is our Assistant News Editor at Love FM. Thank you all for your time with us this morning.